Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone to another live lesson. It's Phil here and you're watching Playground Sessions channel and I really appreciate that you are. We are still trying to grow this channel and all the efforts that we're doing here in terms of outreach to the community. We want to get as many people playing as we can and in order to do that we want to grow these channels. So if you guys have a friend or a family member that you think would want to learn the piano and get a kick out of these live lessons and joining our discussion, please let them know. Share the video out, but maybe more impactfully, let someone know with a personal message. That would be really, really cool. But welcome everyone. Everyone can play Bach. I hope no one is, uh, is thinking that that statement is false. And in fact, what we're seeing in the progress so far in this Prelude in C challenge has been just to confirm this. Even rookies are able to play the advanced notation. Now, of course, there's a lot of work to do. And in some ways, you might be feeling like we are you know, moving at a snail's pace in the rookie pla uh, path. But I don't want you to feel that way at all. In fact, as you're seeing, for those of you who have started section two, uh, you know, we're doing at least a new measure a day right, in rookie. So that's quite a bit if you think about the notes, the patterns, the rhythms, um, and all that. So we're really excited to say that we think so far the statement is correct here. Everybody can play Bach. Now sometimes you may have to put in more work than others, but that's okay. This stuff is accessible enough that you can put in the work to get results. It's not impossible. So what I want to do today is check back in with you guys on your progress. Now that section two has been kicked off, I'm seeing a lot of great comments uh, and questions coming through. I just want to say hey to some people here. Margarita, how's it going? Hey, Warren W., Eric Lawson, I see your, your question. I'm going to get to that in just a bit. I uh, just want to say hey to some people. Charles Smith, Robert Atkins, what's going on? Hey, Lily May. Jamie Shilley, nice to see you. Barbara Fazio, nice to see you. All right. Elta John in the house. Joe Cooser, hey, guys. Anderlin Casanol, that's a, a new name in the chat. How's it going, Anderlin? David Warden. What's going on? So happy to see everyone. I hope all of you have been trying the Prelude and C piece in the course in the, in the app. Uh, if you haven't yet, I encourage you to check it out. By the way, we're doing a free trial with our interactive app. You can try the app for 30 days for free, and every app member gets access for free to the Prelude and C course, which can be found in the Courses tab in your app. So if you haven't tried it and you're on the fence and you've been thinking about it, now's your time. And anyone else in the chat that is doing it, if you agree with me, let these people know too. It's time. Let them know uh, what to expect when they join. If you're enjoying it, if you're having fun with it, let them know they may feel the same way. All right, so everybody can play Bach. And what we're doing, by the way, let me know, you guys, if you can hear the keyboard OK, and if it's uh, loud enough or if it's too loud or not loud enough. Okay, so help me out there. Aiden is out today, you guys. So it's just me and Andrew today. And say hey to Andrew, by the way. Uh, Aiden's out today, so I'm, du I'm double duty today. Uh, I'm Phil and Aiden for the day. So let me know if that mix sounds okay here. Elta John asks, where's the beautiful intro that gets us all warmed up? Good question, Elta. I was doing Aiden's job too, so I wasn't playing, but I'll give that to you now. I'm going to pretend like we just started, and I'm going to give you my, my little intro. Oh, and Margarita is saying that the keyboard is audible just fine. Perfect. Thank you. All right, Elta, here's your intro. You go Elta that one was just for you <laughs> that one was called Elta's song wrote it on the fly uh, thanks for the request all right well let's get back to Bach I want to get to some of the questions and comments I'm seeing in the chat 
The goal for today is going to be to answer any and every question and comment that I see that is related to Prelude and C, because this is a real-time check-in. I want you guys to think about this as a, an opportunity to ask your teacher something, right, about the piece you're learning. So hit me. And we'll get started with a question from Charles Smith. So Charles Smith asks, when reading sheet music, it seems like you could memorize the entire song by thinking about chord outlines. Is this correct? Charles Smith, my man. I'm going to go ahead and toss you a free song credit, Charles Smith, for that, because that just lobbed up the perfect, uh, you know, that was the perfect question for me to, uh, to, to give you a lesson on this. And you're absolutely right that uh, it's a great observation. So you get a free song credit for that contribution, Charles Smith. Thank you. And you guys, Charles is right. Um, in, in case you haven't figured it out by now, the rhythmic pattern that runs through every measure or chord shape uh, is the same from measure to measure. And briefly, I'll take the first four measures uh, that we all should be very familiar with by now. And I'll show you what I mean, right? So the rhythmic pattern starts from the bottom of the chord shape and goes up to the top. And then we repeat the top three right notes again. So we all know that. We move to the next measure is a new shape. I've been talking about these as shapes or, or hand positions. So the first one is this, right? And the second shape in measure two is this. Now, if you looked at them as eight individual notes per measure, you would probably see it like this. Okay, one note, one note, there's that. I think it's th this one, then what is it? This one, and then back to here. Oh, back to left hand again. If you think about it as all eight separate notes like that, uh, you're going to, in fact, I guess it'd be 16 separate notes, right, in the measure, because it, it, the pattern happens twice. If you think about it like that, it's going to be very difficult to memorize it, because you've got 16 independent notes per measure. Now, instead of trying to do it that way, if you could find a way to group some or all of those notes into one thing, call it a, a group, a position, a shape, an outline, um, I like to think about it as a shape, because visually, uh, it's something that I can sort of recall visually. Here's one shape. Here's a shape. Here's a shape. Here's a shape. And if you can think about the shapes, or the hand positions, uh, as one unit, then it's no longer 16 individual notes. Instead, it's just one thing to memorize. That thing to memorize is a two-hand shape, a chord shape. And so, yes, 100%, um, Charles, was it Charles that asked this? Yeah, oh, a lot of questions today, this is great. 100% Charles Smith, um, if you are able to look at the first four measures, for example, as simply four shapes, one, two, three, and then that fourth one, as we know, is the same as the first. So really it's just three separate shapes to memorize. And then after you've memorized the shapes, all you have to do is remember that same rhythmic pattern that repeats through every measure. Now, in the very end of the piece, you guys, there's going to be a deviation from that pattern. But up until now, and including into section three even, and a bit of section four, this is true. The rhythmic pattern does not change. Uh, and so for, for the most part, we can just say it's the same. When we get to the end end, we'll talk about that. But if you can memorize that rhythmic pattern, then you simply just apply that pattern to every shape. And Charles, you got it, man. That's it. And it's super easy. It's much easier, I should say, to memorize when you're looking at one big shape and then you're doing stuff within that shape. Here's the shape, and I'm going to do this pattern through the shape. That's just one thing to think about, not 16 different things. Then you have to think about transitioning to the next shape. So that is this. But again, if you're thinking about it as a chord shape, that's just one unit and not separate different notes. I love the question, Charles, and I hope everyone can take away from this lesson. If there's one thing you come away with from today, I hope it's this. I hope it's what Charles is asking about. And that is that if you're having difficulty memorizing this stuff, and by the way, as we learn more and more measures, there's going to be even more to remember, right, each time you play from the beginning. So as we go into next sections, it's even more true. If you're having difficulty memorizing this stuff, Try as hard as you can to see groups of notes as one shape. And one of the many reasons that this piece, Prelude and C, is so popular and accessible 
is because it's composed in a way where you can do that. Every measure is one harmony, one shape, and that rhythmic pattern is so repetitive. So yes, Charles Smith, I love that. Thank you for asking. And enjoy that free song credit. That was a great question and a great observation. Joe Kuser asks, do we even keep track of the <laughs> free song credits, or can we just email you randomly? That's funny. Uh, Joe, you can try, but <laughs> Andrew is pretty diligent. Uh, Andrew's sitting in the room with me for these live lessons, so whenever anyone wins, he makes a little note to himself. Um, but hey, if you, if you find a way to get a free song credit, slip through our radar. There you go. Enjoy, enjoy your free song credit. <laughs> but no, Andrew's keeping notes so that uh, you know, people don't take advantage. Um, if you want a free song credit, you just got to get a pop quiz question right. So if we want to talk about that, I say we shift gears right now and, uh, and get into a little bit of pop quiz action. And let's see if I can do what Aiden usually does. Bam! There we go. Pop quiz number one. <laughs> so you guys, here is a question for everyone. And then I am going to uh, get back into the comments because there's a ton of, of good ones going on today. Uh, pop quiz number one. So, we, we're in the middle of section two right now, right? You guys have started section two. Um, for rookies, section two is covering measure five through eight. Uh, that's the second four measure phrase. For intermediate players, you, you already covered measure five through eight uh, earlier, right? So you, everyone at this point should be familiar with measure five in the notation. So this pop quiz question has to do with measure five. No cheating, no peeking at your scores unless you have to. What, it's going to be the quickest answer wins, the first answer. What is the highest right hand note in the score in measure five? The highest right hand note. I'm looking for the first correct answer. And I'm going to give you a minute here and just sort of play a little bit. Hey Lauren. Now, I'm going to play it. Let's see what happens when I get to measure five. Here's measure two. Highest note is F. Measure three. Highest note is still F. Here comes measure four. Now, measure five. Ready, guys? Left hand C, E. Right hand A. E, A. So this is the first time that we're getting into this right hand octave position where we need to have our first right hand note be a given note, in this case A, and our final top right hand note is an octave above, so the A above. And our third finger is on E. So the highest note of that measure is A. I saw a handful of answers come in the chat. The first correct answer was Robert Atkins. Way to go, Robert. There's a free song credit for you, my man. So just email support at playgroundsessions.com uh, and Andrew will be waiting for you. Uh, honorable mentions go to Michael Bursky and Jamie Shilley as well. Good job, you guys. Uh, so I'm going to say that there's going to be one more chance to earn a free song credit later in today's lesson before we end. But let's get back into the chat here. And I would like to, let's see, bam, I'm doing the graphics too tonight, guys. <laughs> so. I want to get back into some of these Bach-related questions. Charles Smith had a great one. Uh, I am going to, uh, here's one from Eric Lawson. Uh, Eric Lawson says, hey, uh, question, with or without the metronome, counting my one E and a uh, is never smooth. I have tried everything to keep pace, but I seem to speed up or slow down without intending to. Any suggestions? Okay, Eric, this is a great question too. So. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that go into this question. One is about the syllables and how to count and how to subdivide, whether you're saying it out loud or in your head. That's one thing we'll talk about. The other thing, uh, regardless of how you're marking the beats in your head, uh, it seems like you're also saying that you're having a hard time playing with even timing. Uh, and those two things very well could be related, so let's discuss. Um, typically, uh, we think about tempos as something like, you know, the slower it is, the easier it is. The faster it is, the harder it is. But 
I'm not certain that's true, actually. I think more realistically, there's a sweet spot in the middle where there's a comfortable tempo. And if we go too fast, it's too fast. Um, that means it is uncomfortably fast, but it can also be too slow, uncomfortably slow. Our hands may have a tempo sort of naturally built into the muscle memory that we want to, uh, you know, uh, lean on when we're playing. It may be faster or slower than the tempo that you're pra asked to practice in the app, right? So that's part of it. So don't, don't think to yourself, oh man, even at a slow tempo, I can't play evenly. Because everyone's got a different sweet spot or comfort level with, uh, with tempos. And it's not the case that the slower, the, the easier. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing to think about is when you're playing in time, there's actually a few things that you're doing at once, a few challenges. One is playing even timing, like you're saying, right? So that's one. You have to be able to play not too fast, not too slow, just right. But there's also more that you are uh, supposed to be working on or that you have to be working on uh, at the same time. And that, of course, would be playing the right notes in the right timing. Um, you have to know the rhythms. Rhythms are separate from timing, you guys. You can have quarter note rhythms or eighth note rhythms or a mixture, but you want to keep that even metronomic pulse while you're playing your rhythms. So those are two separate things. Um, so really, whether you think about it, whether you know it or not, when I'm practicing this right here, I'm practicing even tempo and playing the right notes. Okay, so there's more than one challenge happening at once. And whenever you guys are feeling like there is something that's too challenging for you, I want you to stop. I want you to analyze all of the individual challenges that are, you're, you're working on and try and strip away some so that you're just working on the thing that you want to work on most. Now, let me explain what I actually mean by that. That was kind of long-winded. So. Uh, if you're struggling with the timing, but not necessarily the, playing the correct notes, then I want you to strip away the challenge of playing the right notes, and I want you to only solely focus on even timing. And to do that, uh, I will suggest one of a few things. You can pick two notes, ideally it would be like C and C, and you can play your rhythms, pick your two finger maybe, uh, just with those notes. You can do it with the app as well, so it'll keep time for you, but of course, you would get a really bad score if you did this. But I want you to practice this. Ready? One E and a, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a. Obviously, that's not the right fingers or the right notes, hand positions, or any of that, right? When it comes time to perform this piece, you wouldn't do it like that. But we're not performing now. We're talking about practicing and how to get it, it better in your practice room. So you have to be willing to deviate from the piece a bit in a way to isolate a certain problem that you want to work on and then put it back into the context of the piece when you've worked it out. So uh, one way to do it, like I said, would be to just pick random notes that you don't have to think about so your, your sole focus is on the timing and you really just want to lock in with the metronome so that you're playing evenly with the metronome. Once you can do it with basic notes, then work on adding the real notes back in and your timing should be a little bit more consistent and a little stronger then. The other thing you could do is if you don't want to play real keys on the keyboard and, and, and get mixed up is you can you can't see my knees right now but you can just kind of tap on your knees or on a table uh, tap the timing because literally that's what you're doing when you're playing the piano you're pushing or hitting something right the piano is also a percussive instrument um, and so what you want to do is practice the rhythmic nature of playing the keys in time. We don't need to worry about the notes or the melody of it yet. We want to strip that away for now, just work on even timing. So you can do it on your knees, right? One, E, and, a, uh, two, E, and, a. Uh. And, uh, and then once you get that down, slowly incorporate the right notes back in. So Eric, I'm going to leave it with that. I hope that that helps you. Um, there's a couple of things you can try. But overall, I'll just say that make sure you're patient with yourself. It's not just a given that when you learn the notes from your teacher, now you can play it perfectly in time. Sometimes there's a gap there where you really need to work it out and go through some challenges and persist through those challenges. Then you come out the other side. Not only do you have the piece down better, but now your internal timing is better even when you go to a new piece. All right, So you've got to work for it sometimes, but uh, you're doing the right thing.
and uh, don't give up. All right, guys, let's keep it moving. Robert Atkins asks, is there going to be a certain number of video entries needed to unlock part three? Okay, ready, Robert? The answer is yes, but my answer for now is we don't know. We're not, we are not going to disclose what the number is because, again, we want to watch you guys through the, the learning process. We want to check in regularly, and we want to gauge your progress for, uh, for when and how to move on with the next section. So let's get to the end of section two, and I want to see how many of us actually completed the section two lessons. We've got all the data on the back end, right, to see how many people are practicing, what's the scores, what are the average scores, that kind of thing, right? So uh, we're looking at that to see what is a reasonable goal for you guys. And we're trying to react in real time. So I'll say this, uh, Robert, um, section three will be offered if you guys nail section two just like you nailed section one. Now, how many we need to... Uh, to unlock it, we're going to wait and see how the rest of section two goes. But I'm glad you guys are getting excited already for the next section. Don't forget too, guys, at the end of section two, we're not just leaving it there with the new measures. We're also incorporating the new stuff from section two into what we already did in section one. So by the end of section two, you're going to have practiced and hopefully be able to play all the way from the beginning of the piece through the end of measure two, not just excuse me, section two, not just section two's material, okay? So let's, let's be patient, let's stay focused on section two, and if we nail it, then sure enough, we'll serve up section three. All right, Warren W. asks, in the early lessons, I found some alternate fingering that worked for me. It does involve hand moving. Am I setting myself up for trouble later? Great question, Warren, and you know, it's hard for me to answer the last part of that question without knowing what fingering or hand position change you you decided on, but I will say this, in general, fingering is, yes, somewhat subjective. Um, you can definitely find examples in piano music where one pianist would do it one way, another would do it another way, and they're both completely valid. Um, however, the majority of the time, the fingering suggestions are made uh, with a reason. They're, they're made uh, with the goal of having the most comfortable and effortless physical motion in your hand uh, to, to play the passage. Now that's the general rule. Of course it's bent often and, and there are reasons to bend it. But I would say this, uh, the fingering suggestion is at least a great place to start. From there, um, I would encourage you to say, hey, if my hand is too small or too big, you know, I'm going to make an adjustment. Or, hey, I broke my, my ring finger you know, last year, I gotta make an adjustment. Um, however, I would, I would caution you uh, that sometimes the correct fingering might seem like a challenge in the moment when you're learning it. And you may think to yourself, hey, why do they have me using my fourth finger here? I wanna use my fifth finger here. I would ask that you trust in the fingering suggestions a little bit and try and learn it that way first. Uh, here's a quick example uh, in the first four measures, right, from section one. Everyone should remember this. We start measure one with this fingering here. Now, if we were not considering any future measures, this would probably be the quote unquote wrong fingering because I'm straining, I'm stretching a bit more than I would have to just to play these five notes. I might instead want to do something like this, right? Three in the left hand here, and I might want to put my pinky on E here, so something like this. Technically, that's more comfortable for my hands, right, and my fingers. But we're not only looking at measure one to consider what's the, the easiest fingering here. We need to look at a larger phrase. Measure one and measure two combined, check this out. If I played it with this fingering and then switched to measure two. Now I have to, again, move my left hand and then move all three of my right hand fingers, okay? Now, let's pause there, let's go back to measure one, and remember that this is the actual fingering we taught. Again, it's slightly less comfortable in the abstract, but when you put it into the context of going into measure two, watch how much easier it is for my right hand. Third and fifth fingers are already waiting, ready to play, so I just move my thumbs. So when you look at both measures as one phrase, 
then it becomes very obvious which fingering suggestion allows for the least amount of motion in your hands. It was the second one. But if you just look at that first measure alone, you might think, hey, why do they want me to do this? It's way more comfortable to do this. But of course, later when you learn measure two, you would then learn, ah, that's why they wanted me to do it that way in measure one. I hope this is making sense. And this is all just to say that I hope you'll, you'll, you'll learn it the way we suggest and be able to do it that way, then determine if there's a way that you feel is better, as opposed to trying it once or twice and saying, hey, wait, that feels uncomfortable with my pinky, for example, so I'm just not going to do it that way. Don't do that, because a lot of times you should be using your pinky and your ring fingers, but we overcompensate with these guys. So just because you feel a little discomfort in these fingers doesn't mean the fingering suggestion is wrong. It might just mean you need a little extra practice with these fingers. Great question. Um, of course, there are, like I said, uh, instances where we, we could uh, break that and, and change that. In fact, there was one example where, um, I think it was last week or the week before, we were talking about something like the right hand in measure five, where you have an octave position. There's a few of these in the right hand in this piece. And maybe it was Sarah or Elta, I forget who asked, but for those who have smaller hands and it's difficult to play an entire octave, you're not going to change the fingering here. You're still going to do one, three, five. But you can make an adjustment or an accommodation uh, if your hand is too small. You can kind of roll through it and not have to stick in that position. That's kind of one example of, it's not the best example because it's the same finger numbers. But yeah, so I guess uh, what I would do, Warren, is I would just want to ask you for a follow-up. What in particular, what spot was it in the piece and uh, what is the new fingering that you uh, are trying and, and why? Maybe, uh, maybe we can talk more about it. But let's keep moving. You guys are asking great ones today. Um, Lily May asks, any tips for creating arrangements of classical songs? Yeah, this will be fun. In fact, this could be an entire lesson just on this topic, so I'll keep it on the briefer side. But Lily May, sometimes what I'm doing in these lessons, like as the intros or my little improv music, Sometimes I'm basically taking the theme of what we're going to focus on and improvising a little bit. And I also like to call improvising spontaneous composing or spontaneous arranging. So if I'm in the mindset of Prelude and C, and I'm going to just jam a little bit for you guys, I'm not going to do this verbatim note for note. I mean, I could, I might, but if I'm trying to have some fun and, and give you guys sort of a hint at the piece, but make it my own, then what I'm doing essentially, Lily May, is creating an arrangement on the fly for that piece. And here's how I do it. Uh, I have to do a bit of analysis. I have to figure out what is the chord progression. And in classical music, sometimes that can be more difficult to determine because more often than not, we're playing sweeping or arpeggios or two-hand fra you know, melodic phrases as opposed to like in a pop or rock style where we're playing chunky chords and a melody. Um, but nonetheless, there still is implied harmony that we can, <coughs> excuse me, that we can figure out a chord progression from. So I, I try and boil it down, Lily Mae, to the bare essentials. So this is just a fancy way to rhythmicize a C major chord. If we know that, then I can do anything with C major harmony with 16th note rhythm. So I might do this instead. Just making it up as I go, but I'm borrowing from the core elements of the piece that I'm familiar with, like the harmony and the rhythmic pattern. And then I'm kind of making it my own by expanding on things like range um, and, and more. Uh, so I can give you another example here. I'll look at the first four measures. The progression is C major to a D minor 7 to a G7 to back to a C major. So the 1 chord in the key of C, the 2 chord in the key of C, the 5 chord in the key of C, back to the 1 chord. So here we have a, five, a 1, 2, 5, 1 progression. All right, cool, I can do whatever I want with that. I'm gonna try and keep the rhythm somewhat reminiscent of the piece. 
but I'll try this now with my own sort of version, with my own chords. And all I'm doing here, Lily Mae, is just finding different ways to voice the basic harmony that we've just established. So the first one, C, I could just do this. And D minor, I could do this. But that's a little boring for me uh, personally, so I'm going to expand on that in the left hand. Typically, I'm going to open up to beyond an octave, and I'm going to drop a bit lower in range. Uh, right hand, I'm going to try and keep somewhat consistent with the piece so that we still feel like it's the piece. Let's try it. Let's see what happens here. Alright, so we could have fun with that, but really there's all sorts of stuff you could do. The key to remember here at Lily May is you need to do a bit of analysis first to boil down the piece to its essentials. Essential elements only. What is the basic harmony? What is the basic form? What's the progression? And then if there's a clear melody, what's the, what's the melody, right? And you got to try and keep that stuff intact, but you want to get it as basic as you can. Uh, and then from there, you can get complex again on your own end, right, with your arrangement. And Lily, I just saw you wrote in the chat here, uh, sounds like doing some study on classical improvisation would be good for me to start working on. I won't say no to that, but I'll tell you, you could even simplify that for now and just say a great thing to work on would be arpeggios through every harmony. Arpeggios, arpeggiations are really like, if I could be just kind of blunt and, simp and oversimplified, it's kind of like the, the, the shortcut to improvising in a classical style. I'll show you what I mean here. So instead of doing more in the left hand this time, I'll do more in the right hand. Lily May, I think you're ready to start practicing this stuff. So I'm going to do C major chord arpeggios up and down. Check this out. I'll start with root position. That's kind of like a way to improvise in a quote-unquote classical style uh, because it's a basic harmony, a triadic harmony that allows you to like flutter really quickly and, flower, and, and, and flowery. Uh, and then you could do that in different inversions as well, Lily May here. So first inversion, second inversion, back to root. Okay. Uh, and then you could also do uh, that through the whole progression. So I'll do C. Actually, before I even move into the progression, you could mix up your uh, root and inversions as well. Check this out. This is a lot of what I actually practice when I personally sit down to practice, by the way. Just, you know, flowing through different shapes and harmonies that I know uh, will work over certain chords and just freeing up like that. Uh, so then Lily May do the same thing through the progression, which we remember is C, D minor, G7, and C. So we'll take C, D minor, G7, back to C. All right, let's get back to the piece here and to the chat. But Lily, that's fun. If you have some follow-up questions for me on that, feel free to reach out. Uh, but I would 100% recommend that you, you do what I just did as part of your warm-up routine when you're practicing. Pick a couple of uh, triads and start flowing through arpeggios. All right, let's keep it moving, guys. Um, <clears throat> All right, so Joe Kuser, this is an interesting question. Joe says, I've started practicing Prelude in C with my eyes closed, and I've been amazed at how awesome it is. That's cool. Any recommendations for or against this approach? <clears throat> All right, Joe. Well, I'll say um, it depends on where you are in your 
process of learning. So if you've got this piece memorized to the point where you can play it with your eyes closed, and you've got your hands up on the keyboard, and you don't even need to look, and you, you just know which notes to push, if that's the case, I would actually say you're smart for practicing it that way. Because at a certain point, when you don't need the notation in front of you anymore, it, the notation can become kind of a crutch to hinder your full memorization of the piece, if memorization is your goal. And so at that point, Joe, yeah, man, if you can, if you can shut the app and close your eyes and do it, then enjoy it. That must be awesome. That it really is a good feeling when you know a piece that well that you can close your eyes and just think about expression instead of, wait, what's that note again? What's that next finger again? Was that the right rhythm? Uh, where am I in the music? You know. Uh, so, of course, now having said that, if you're not at that final stage where you've pretty much got the piece memorized, then you're probably going to be doing more harm than good. Um, because remember, anything that you practice physically with your hands will build towards your hands muscle memory. So if you practice something 20 times wrong, you mess up 20 times in a row, but then you play it once right, you guys have heard me say this before, then your hand still knows it like 20 ways wrong and one way right. You've got to do at least 20 right to balance it back out. And the same thing kind of applies here, Joe. If you, you, you learn something and you practice it a few times and then you say, hey, this is awesome, I'm now going to practice it with my eyes closed. And you go, okay, my eyes are closed. Oops. 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 Right, that's not helping anything. In fact, you're going to be building up kind of the wrong muscle memory. I'm sure you're not doing that, Joe. But, uh, but that's my only argument against doing that. I love closing my eyes and just feeling the music, you guys, no matter what it is that I'm playing. Obviously, I've got to know, if I'm playing a piece from a score, like Prelude and C, I'm going to want to really make sure I know it well before performing it with my eyes closed, of course. But yeah, if you can, if you can work towards that goal and you can successfully do it, that just means that you really got the piece internalized. So, very cool. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Anderlin asks, how can I connect at the same time an iPad and a PC with a PSR E363? So Anderlin, I actually am not familiar with that model, but what I want to do is steer you towards our support team. Oh, in fact, I think Andrew maybe already wrote an answer in the chat. Oh, no, he, oh, I see, I see, cool. So, um, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, I was going to have the support team officially say that. But the answer uh, from Andrew here is that it is not possible to connect two devices to a keyboard at the same time, uh, at least not with Playground Sessions. There are things like MIDI splitters and USB splitters, but yeah, like, like through MIDI, things like that. Um, there may be a way to kind of patch stuff together and hack it, but in general, they're not really made, uh, made for that. Um, and so, um, yeah, if you have a follow-up question on that, let me know, or, or email support, and they can help you troubleshoot a bit more. Uh, the support team is really great with helping, helping work through any model of keyboard or, or, or computer that you guys have. So uh, support at playgroundsessions.com. All right, Sarah Pickles, this is an interesting question. Um, Sarah asks, can you break this down to seeing the left hand as pickup notes and the right hand as two triplets? So it would go pick up. Pick up triplet, triplet, pick up triplet. Hey, that would, if you said it like that and it was all even, then that would be correct. But the one thing I would caution you against here, Sarah, is the word triplet uh, specifically is meant to be said uh, or, or marked as a triplet rhythm, which is separate from two eighth notes or three eighth notes. So my hesitation with, with having you say triplets is you might accidentally play it like this. One and triplet, triplet, one and triplet, which would not be right, okay? Now I think I know what you're saying. You're not actually saying you want to play them as tr eighth note triplet rhythms. Um, instead, I think what you're saying is you want to think about them as a group of three notes. So you have triplet, and it's a group of three, and then that repeats. So you have pick up, which is a two-syllable word, 
So I like that. Pick up, and then here we have a three-syllable word. Triplet, triplet. Just make sure that you're playing all eight of those notes with even, consistent timing. You don't want to play the, the three right-hand notes faster, okay? But you could really put any syllables to this. And Sarah, this is actually an interesting idea. Let's see if I can do this. Um, Sarah pit, pickles, pickles. No, that doesn't quite work. But we can pick any syllable here. Um, playground sessions. Oh, I'm not actually. My name. My name is five syllables. Thank you, Andrew. Philip Anderson. Anderson. No, that's wrong too. <laughs> I'm just having fun, but I hear. I think you hear what I'm saying. Um, by all means, you guys, saying one e and a, two e and a, that has worked for uh, many years for people. But I like to have fun with it. However, you want to mark this stuff with syllables is okay with me. The important thing is that you remember the left hand has two notes, the right hand has three, and then the right hand repeats those three. Okay, cool. I'm always down for having fun with this stuff and coming up with our own versions. Uh, all right, Elta John asks, how did I decide what notes to play in my intro? Uh, did I use some of the same keys? Yeah, Elta, I, can, uh, I don't remember exactly what I did, but I remember what was in my head when I was playing, and that was to kind of keep it between C major and F major. Um, C major is where we are for prelude in C, of course. So I started in C. And what, in terms of what notes to pick, I'm just picking all notes that I know work in C. So sometimes I'll do arpeggios of a C chord, or I'll do a scale, stuff like that. Uh, and then I would go to a different chord, so like the F chord. And then in the right hand, sometimes I'll play triads from the key. That was it. So at, again, kind of tying back to what I said to Lily May's question, which was, you know, how to arrange a classical piece, you want to boil it down to the simplest elements and then expand on that. Uh, the same is true here for whenever, whenever I'm improvising here. Um, I, what I do is uh, boil it down to what I want to do in simple forms. Okay, let's just loop C major to F major, and I'm going to get flowery in my right hand. That might be all I think to myself. And then this comes out of that. Arpeggios, all C major, and then F major. Just going back and forth. Now we'll leave it there. If you guys want to talk more about improvisation, obviously that can be a series of lessons, not only just one lesson. Um, but yeah, uh, Elta, that's how I was doing that in the beginning. And I did use some of the same keys. In fact, I used quite a bit of them, right? Because I was just using two chords uh, and staying in that same key. All right, let's see here. Oh, here's an interesting question from MP. Hey, MP. MP says, fairly new to playground sessions, but I'm on boot camp lesson 40 in the rookie level and learning superstitious. Cool. Uh, is it odd that I do better with both hands on full speed versus slow? The reason I wanted to address this question quickly is because it kind of ties back to what I want to say maybe it was Eric Lawson uh, who was asking about tempos. Uh, but uh, the question essentially is, like, why am I able to do better at full speed than I am at slow speed? And this ties back to my previous answer because it, it's not the case to assume that the slower the tempo, the easier it is. In fact, if that were the case, in Prelude and C, we'd be serving up those lessons at like 5 BPM, right? Why not slower than 26 or whatever it is that we started for the slow tempo? But obviously at 1 BPM, for example, it would be so slow that you would not even be able to decipher the rhythms. So that's an extreme example, but it's not true that the slower you go, the easier it is. There's a sweet spot for tempos, and everyone has maybe a different sweet spot. You could almost think about it like your vocal range. Too high of a note is really hard to sing, so the lower the easier, right? Well, sure, up to a certain point, 
but then you start singing down here, and you can get to, it's, something can be too low for you as well. It's kind of the same here, um, and so with tempo, uh, you can obviously go too slow, so often the full tempo, the correct performance tempo, is not ultra fast if the song itself is not ultra fast. If you have a song like a ballad or you know any kind of a slower song, even its full tempo is not going to be blazing fast. So sometimes the full tempo is actually more comfortable for you and your hands than the slower practice tempo. And that's normal. The key takeaway here is that you want to find that middle ground comfortable tempo. Uh, and often people may go too slow searching for an easy tempo. Don't go too slow. All right, Robert Atkins asks, what would a reharmonization of this song sound like? Earlier I heard a jazz fugue. Would be interested in hearing it in another context. <laughs> That's cool. That's a cool idea. Um, you know, it depends on who's doing the reharming. But I'm going to answer this question in part because you guys voted on uh, you guys voted on reharmonization as a topic uh, for our next live lesson topic. But then we kicked off Prelude and C, and so uh, we wanted to kind of first make ourselves available to ask uh, questions and comments. Uh, and so uh, I also just saw a comment from VT. Can we focus on this Bach piece instead, please? Fair point, VT, um, because after all, that is the point of this. So Robert, what I'm going to say is this. Uh, I'm going to keep your comment in my back pocket for once we get into reharmonization. Uh, we can look at Prelude and C as an example of a piece and how to reharm. Um, and let's get back to VT's suggestion of focusing on the piece. So I'm going to see if there are any other uh, questions or comments specific to the piece, and I'm just going to slide through. I'm going to check in with Andrew and see if there's any other questions about that. Um, and you know, if not, and I'm, I actually don't see any specifically related to the piece. So VT, what I want to do is spend the next couple minutes just sort of summarizing a bit of what I talked about in my expression lesson in section one. We want to talk about bringing the piece to life making it sound beautiful. I just really want to hammer this stuff home and I want to ask you guys uh, what are some of the challenges that you're facing now that you're into section two? If I get any other questions between now and, and seven, uh, I'll, I'll drop what I'm doing and I'll address them. But uh, in the meantime, I just want to talk about a few things that I've noticed. One is related to touch, all right? Now, it, you, may, you may find that your thumbs in general are heavier than some of your other fingers. And it's natural, right? We, we can thump down with our thumb. It's a, it's a heavier one, a little weaker and, and a little more timid. Um, so it's often the case that if we were going to play five notes with our right hand, the C would be the loudest if we weren't thinking about it. That may be what it sounds like when, when many of you play it. And I'm exaggerating it. In the left hand, we might play the same five notes, but the G might be louder, because that's where our thumb is. And so, first of all, we need to recognize that this is a natural tendency for any pianist, especially a, a student. Um, and, and, and forgive ourselves, that's okay. But we need to be aware that we have the tendency to do that so that we can work on it, right, and correct it. What we don't want to do with this piece is do something like this. You hear what I'm doing? I'm accenting my thumbs. I'm exaggerating it to show my point here, but if we're not careful and we're not listening to our touch and what's coming out of the instrument as a result of our touch, then we're not going to have uh, a, as sweet or as uh, legato or smooth of a, of a phrase as we could or arguably should. And so I want you to instead think about before working on a volume arc, right, or a dynamic arc, I want you to just first focus on being able to play all five notes with the same articulation, the same velocity, the same force, without accenting any of them. So once again, here's what we don't want to do. What we do want to do is something more like this.
And it takes some effort, it really does, because you're playing with all different fingers, pointers, thumbs, uh, ring, you know, we have to play evenly across the fingers. So I encourage everyone to practice this specific thing. Pick a measure, measure one, or if you're feeling good about it, maybe do the first four measures. I want you to try playing it and listening to yourself the whole time and seeing if you can play it without any note jumping out or being accented. Nice and sweet. Now if I accidentally accent a note, it sounds like this. All right, so we want to avoid that. I'm going to leave it with that tip, um, and I think we'll leave it there for the night. I'm still seeing comments come through, so guys, I'm sorry to cut short, but I really appreciate the active chat tonight. If anything, it just makes me realize that these are valuable check-ins as we're learning this big community piece together. Uh, and so, uh, tune in next week, you guys. If you have questions that I didn't get to, uh, if you can show up in the chat early and, and put them in next week, you might even be able to get uh, into the chat for next week's video early. You might be able to get in there now and leave questions ahead of time. That may help. We're going to wrap things up with a quick pop quiz, you guys, because I want to give one more free song credit away. Boom! Pop quiz number two. There it is. <laughs> That's my pop quiz two theme music. All right, you guys, this is, uh, to be fair, this is not something that I have taught before. This is going to be a, sort of a bonus question. Um, and it's something that I have maybe mentioned quickly in passing. Uh, but uh, we're going to see if anyone knows. The first correct answer. Bach wrote this piece to be part of a book of pieces called The Well-Tempered Clavier. You guys know that. He had some students, right? So this was for his students. And one of his students was his son. Now, his son eventually would go on to become a known composer as well. And so when we say Bach, often we have to specify. Are we talking about Bach Bach or Bach's son? And the way that we specify is by using their initials. So Bach, who wrote Prelude in C, his name is Johann Sebastian Bach. J.S. Bach. Anyone know his son's name? Bach's son's name. I'll accept two forms of this. One of two forms. One would be spelling out his name. The equivalent would be Johann Sebastian Bach, but for his son's name, of course. Or you could do the initials. So the equivalent would be J.S. Bach. But we're looking for his son's name. Does anyone know? Yeah, that's a good point. Andrew says that he actually has more than one, uh, and, but I think there's one that's clearly most uh, sort of famous of his, of his kids. Um, and Junior Bach, Joe Kuster said, Junior Bach. Um, maybe they called him that, but that's not the answer I'm looking for. That's funny, though. All right, let's see if we can get, uh, get a couple more answers in, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for the day. Oh, Junior J.S. Bach. I see. That's funny, Joe. Autocorrect wasn't ready for that joke. Baby Bach. He invented those ribs. <laughs> Charles. I want my baby Bach, baby Bach, baby Bach. Okay. Someone else said something about Bach, 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 like, like Bach chickens earlier. You guys are on it with the jokes. The correct answer is C.P.E. Bach. C.P.E. Bach, you guys. So Lynn Stewart in the house. Lynn Stewart came out blazing with that one. Uh, C.P.E. right out of the gate. Lynn Stewart, you win a free song credit. Now, Andrew, keep me honest here. What does C.P.E. stand for? Carl Philip Emanuel. Carl Philip Emanuel Bach. And so, Lily May, I'm going to go ahead and give you an honorary free song credit as well because you put Carl. And Carl is that first part of C.P.E. Bach. So Lynn Stewart and Lily May, you guys are winners of pop quiz number two. Let Andrew know in your email to support at playgroundsessions.com. And I will see all of you 6 p.m. sharp next week, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern. Bye now. <laughs>